This is Ben Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. Uh, we're in the home of uh, Mrs. Bert Barefoot in Oklahoma City. Uh, Ms. Barefoot is the widow of uh, Judge Barefoot, who was the uh, judge of the Court of Criminal Appeals for Oklahoma in the late uh, 19 or in the 1940s. Um, the uh, Ms. Barefoot's father made the run of 1889, and she is a pioneer, one of the early graduates of uh, the what is now Central State University, and is. Uh, uh, was a long-time teacher at, uh, taught some years ago in uh, at Chickasha, where she lived for quite a number of years. Uh, I would like to ask Ms. Barefoot to begin with, if you would tell me uh, who your parents were, your your mother's and father's uh, names, and where they were born, and where you were born. My father was Harvey B. Birch Spencer. He was born in Iowa. My mother was Rosa M. Pratt. She was uh, bo born at Shenandoah, Iowa. They came to Oklahoma then? They came to Oklahoma uh, before, uh, at the time of the run, and my father was uh, riding a very fine racehorse and passed a, a number of, of others on the uh, on the border and uh, found Sooners th the land that he want, would like to have at this along the Cimarron River was all preempted and uh, there were tents up and ox teams plowing plowing he went back to the uh, to Kansas where we had spent the winter and brought us in the covered wagon to Kingfisher and he and his father uh, and his uh, brother rode horses down into Oklahoma County and found uh, land still not homesteaded and uh, my father <coughs> came back to Kingfisher and filed on 160 acres which lies uh, at the corner of uh, 120th Street North and Rockwell now of Oklahoma City. Oh yes, the, the run of uh, that was the run of 1889, uh, 1889. and uh, the, did he tell you any uh, any other experiences dealing with the run or those early days that might be particularly interesting? Well, I remember that uh, when he and uh, my uh, uncle who were looking for uh, unsettled uh, homestead uh, land, I remember that uh, they were in, it was in May before they uh, found the land that they finally settled on. And he said they had a hard freeze and all that they had to protect them were their saddle blankets, their saddles for pillows, and the uh, blankets for uh, protection. And they carried with them a frying pan and what little food they would have to have. The, um, what, uh, did he say what they ate on, how they survived uh, as far as food was concerned? I mean, they, they were traveling apparently for two or three weeks. Well, I'm sure they had their guns and killed rabbits and possibly quail. And um, they didn't require the variety of food people did now. I'm sure yeah, they, they had their coffee and. This was your brother who was uh, who was with your father. No, his his brother. His brother. 
his brother. Where were you born? I was born in Iowa, in Crawford County, Iowa. And uh, you, you and your mother remained up there during the period. No, we had gone to Kansas. We spent three years in Kansas. At uh, my father explained to me later that uh, he was uh, on a uh, land about. Uh, the center of a triangle between Dodge City, Garden City, and Scott City. And uh, because water was very hard to uh, come by, he dug one well 190 feet deep, another well 100 feet deep, did not get water in either one, dug those wells by hand with a horse uh, pulling the uh, bucket of mud back, or not mud, but dirt back up for my mother to swing across and unload and send back down the well. And then he became disgusted and uh, moved the two two-room uh, frame building. I remember that Mama took the birdcage down and set it on the bed, and she had some fruit that her father had sent her from Iowa, some canned fruit, and they took that down from the attic and put it in safe keeping. And we rode in the house as the movers moved it to uh, a new location where he knew that he could, would get water when he does. Was your father active in the Boomer movement? No, I wouldn't think so. Did no. you know William Cow? Did he have a nickname? Who? William Cow, who was head of the Boomers at that time. Did he know him or did he have No, a just, just uh, what he read in the papers. Mm -hmm. Yes, he just had faith <laughs> that it would happen. You you wonder why, but uh, he had a hundred head of cattle and some fine horses, and uh, he had to have some place more productive than Kansas was at that that portion of Kansas was at that time to take care of his stock. He actually then came to Kansas to live, not. Oh, no. No, he came there to live. Uh, my mother had an aunt, and uh, they had uh, left Iowa and come there and uh, built a nice four-room home and, and uh, dug a well and put up a windmill and built a good barn, and it was from him that my father got his first uh, hybrid horses. I wonder if any, if he, if it was a part of an impulse, uh, or if he had, uh, or he may not have ever said, you know, I, it's hard to say what makes a person decide they want to come, you know, to come down into a new territory, whether it was an impulse as a result of it being announced, or whether he had anticipated that when they would open it, that he would make the trip. Did he ever say? Well, he and his um, brother and another man had gone over a good deal of the northern part of the country uh, a year or two before and uh, then moved his family down to Etna, Kansas, and uh, there's where we wintered. But I've often myself wondered why he had the courage to break up and come that far with that much stock and uh, not be sure that he was going to get land. It took a lot of courage to do so, sir. Sure did. Yeah, yeah. The, um, did, um, did he recall, now you were what age when you first came in here? 
I was not quite six. Not quite six. You, uh, uh, you probably barely remember those early days. I remember a good deal about it. Uh, my memory of, uh, of how it looked was uh, a waving field of yellow coreopsis standing. Uh, that had been evidently a rather good season, and uh, that coreopsis stood about two feet tall. And uh, that was the, the most uh, vivid memory that I have of the appearance of the land. How long after the, uh, he settled did you all, you and your mother, come down? Oh, well, we came when he came. He, we didn't go. When? He went back immediately after he discovered this uh, farm not uh, filed on. We were then uh, staying at Kingfisher, outside of Kingfisher, and Mama was uh, 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 rounding up the cattle every evening to be sure that none of them were lost. So you were actually there from the beginning, then? Well, oh, you yes. were actually there from the oh, beginning? Oh, yes. The 6th of June is when we landed, the 6th of June, 1889. What was the, uh, what did you live in at the beginning? In a covered wagon, what, in a tent. We had brought our chickens on, uh, in a box on the side of the wagon, and uh, one, one hen had baby chickens, and when we were traveling, while we would let the, uh, at noon, we'd let the chickens out and let them run a little bit and then show them back in the box and put them on the side of the wagon. Milk the cows that furnished us milk. How long did you live in a covered wagon then? Well, just as soon as my father, it seems to me that he first did a little plowing and planted a few uh, vegetables and some corn, and then came to Oklahoma City and got its uh, materials to uh, build a house. What was that first house like? It was a good, large, three-room house and uh, frame with uh, even a glass door at the front door, which I'll tell about later why that uh, served a purpose. And uh, the, um, w there was no schoolhouse that first fall. And my father uh, said, well, we just must have school. And Mama cleared out one r of her three rooms and there's where I went to school for the first time, Did in my you own home. Did your mother teach you? No, no. Where did you get the teacher? What? Where did you get the teacher? I believe the teacher came from Kansas, maybe from Oklahoma City. We had a wonderful teacher later after the schoolhouse was built a quarter of a mile from our house. We had a wonderful teacher from Oklahoma City, uh, but uh, I, I believe that uh, this teacher came from Kansas. I can't even remember the name of the teacher. How many pupils did you have in that first year or so? I think there were about 20. Were they of various grades, like between uh, eight to? Well, after all, I was only six. <laughs> I don't I was barely past six because I was six in August, and I'm not real sure. There were some older children, I know, that Angie Lynch came down four miles from the north, and she was uh, about 12, I believe. I don't know what grade she was in. The, uh, 
why don't you describe downtown Oklahoma City as you remember it, say, uh, uh, all the first year after the Well, I remember very distinctly that uh, my mother said, uh, when you pass by these doors that are open at the t across the top and across the base, you know that's a saloon and you mustn't ha linger. <laughs> they were about, as I remember it, they were about every other door of the, on Grand Avenue. That was the main street, as I remember. And uh, I do recall that there were the first six buildings that uh, that I remember seeing were uh, on Grand and they were uh, there were one-story buildings but they had a half of a hexagonal front cut off at the corners and uh, they were business buildings I'm not real sure, but uh, I remember the uh, the first Fourth of July celebration that I remember, a real celebration. Teddy Roosevelt was here, and uh, we came to that, and they had fireworks after after the parade and all the head fireworks. We had a very high-spirited mayor that my father came on with somebody else, but Mama brought the, we three children in the buggy with, uh, with her, and uh, Hazel was so excited when she got downtown and the firecrackers were uh, being popped her all around her, that she just stood on her hind feet, and four men had to quiet her, <laughs> to uh, and until she was put in a wagon yard. And uh, Oscar Lee owned the wagon yard at that time, and was a very good friend of my father's. Uh, he always uh, put his vehicle there. He was later uh, the owner of uh, the builder of the Huckins Hotel. Lee Huckins. Yeah. Yes, it was a, known as the Lee Huckins, and he started in Oklahoma City with a wagon yard. Tell about the building of the Huckins. That was the first you really well, wasn't that the first big building, or was the coffee building one of them? I just. Do you remember when it was built? See, I uh, no, I just do not. Was that where the overhost was, was built? Uh, there was an, I, I don't know, there was an outdoor type theater. It looked like an outdoor type theater. Uh, where well, the you now. well, you see, I live 14 miles in the country, and <laughs> I didn't yeah. get into an outdoor theater. <laughs> I did, however, uh, go to, um, after my cousin and I, uh, graduated from uh, the eighth grade in the country. We came to town and stayed with an aunt of mine for some sort of a summer course. And uh, at that time, the uh, Overholzer Theater, not the one that they have just destroyed, I think, but one before that, was built and they had uh, the show that we saw, my aunt let us go one night. She lived only two or three blocks from it, and she let us go one night, and the show we saw was Ten Nights in a Bar Room. That was a fine show for a couple of young girls to see, but that's what we saw. And, um, Would that be rated R or GP? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. 
Uh, but uh, on my birthday, this last 11th of August, my lawyer's uh, son took my uh, California son, who was visiting here, and his wife and I to uh, the Twilight Theater, and they had Ten Nights in the Bar Room. That was their uh, show. And uh, someone mentioned the fact that I had uh, seen that when I was a 13-year-old girl in the overall th th theater. So they called me up and had me stand up and tell the difference between the two shows as if I might remember. <laughs> Well, while I'm sure that's the first theater I was ever in, I'm, I really have very little memory of it. Uh, I have a better memory of the, the one that, uh, if it isn't torn down, will be torn down immediately, uh, because it really had some very good shows, very good opera, and... Uh, we came from Chickasha. I was living at Chickasha at that time, and we came over quite often to uh, good uh, shows That's over here. The criterion. No, no. Uh, this uh, Overholster Theater is on Grand. The second one is that what's now the Criterion? No, no, no. It was put. It was right where in the very spot where that one, where the later one was built. The Criterion is on Main Street, and uh, this was on Grand. The, uh, do you remember when the cost of building was built? Do you recall anything about it? I don't know. That was while I was in Chickasha. Of course, by the time I'm... It was What? It was Was Concord built in 1908? Well, I went to Chickasha in 1901. Oh, you did? Oh, well, you're right. I had no idea that I ever met him. I went there in 1901. Uh, well, did. did you know Henry Overholzer, or did you meet him later on? No, my father knew him, uh, but uh, I, I did not. Did you Well, as I uh, spoke about uh, Oscar Lee, and uh, there was a grocerman by the name of Johnson who was quite prominent, and his wife was a niece of A.C. Scott, who was a very prominent citizen and at one time president of Stillwater uh, College and University. I knew A.C. Scott. I knew A.C. Scott, yes. Tell something about him. Well, he was a rather small man, a very uh, intellectual man, a very friendly man. And I knew his, his wife and, uh, and knew his two nieces quite well, and Mrs. Johnson and her sister. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, did you, uh, do you remember any, any of their early, news, the early newspapers that Scott published? No, I don't know that I did. Uh, we always took a daily Oklahoman after that. Well, maybe not all the time after that started, but for years. We had the Daily Oklahoma in, Ch in Chickasha and the Times, and... We had Dr. Scott on tape, incidentally. You had? Yes, from an old, uh, from an old disc recording that was made in 1938. Well, he was a very prominent man and uh, very 
intellectual and... Did you know Dennis Flynn, Territorial Congressman? Well, I knew of Dennis Flynn. He would come to Edmond and speak at the normal while I was there. I was there uh, three or four years, part of the fourth year. And uh, he came there quite. No, that's too long ago. Too, too long ago. Do you remember? Did you know Senator Robert Owen? Well, not not intimately. Now we knew Scott Ferris very intimately, and he and Miss Ferris visited in our home, and when we were in Chickasha, I knew them intimately, and knew uh, 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 Elmer Thomas. The senator, we knew him very well. Swinging back, you were talking about a door, and we got off the subject that you were going to tell me about. Oh, about the door, the glass door. My father, uh, the first winter we were in Oklahoma, he had a number of hogs, and corn bought at Oklahoma City was very high. And he made several trips to um, uh, down to the Canadian River to the Ireton farm and brought back a wagon load of corn for his hogs. Mom and I were there alone, and uh, one night about two o'clock in the morning. Someone knocked on that door, and uh, Mama answered. As soon as he saw a woman, heard a woman's voice, he put his hands up like this at the door to uh, and looked in. And my mother always had a pistol by the bed, and she said, "What is it you want?" And he said, "Lady, I want to know a direction." He said, um, my uh, time is up tomorrow to be away from my farm, and if I'm not there, I'll lose title to it. And she described to him how to go, and he went merrily on his way without any trouble, but I think she would have not been nearly so frightened if he hadn't have looked in at the glass door. <laughs> You were talking about uh, the, the swimming suit when uh, we were talking earlier with Reggie. Why don't you uh, tell us a little about the uh, uh, about the clothing of the time, including the swimming suits and also the other clothing that you were wearing at that time? Well, I remember that uh, young ladies, and that's what I was supposed to be. I had already taught school a term. Uh, they wore their dresses to the floor, and uh, they were um, they were reinforced about twelve inches up all around the bottom of the skirt was reinforced with crinoline, so it would stand out from the rest of the skirt and. Uh, then there was a braid put on the bottom of that to brush the sidewalk as you walk to keep from cutting a hole in the hem of your skirt. And shirt waists were very popular. And large hats with big plumes. And high top shoes. I very well remember the f first pair of shoes I ever paid five dollars for. They were a queen quality, high top shoe. And uh, I'd like to see you buy a pair now for five dollars. How about your swimming suit? Well, that swimming suit was uh, bloomers, just regular bloomers. Uh, elasticized at the knee and uh, a blouse 
with long sleeves and high neck. I don't have a picture of that, I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> did they have Miss America contest and swimming suits like that? Well, if they did, I didn't enter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, during the 1890s, and I knew those were the years that you were growing up, yes. six to 16, uh, what, uh, what for you were the highlights of, uh, of that 10 year period? Well, I'd like to tell about one thing. Uh, that was uh, while my father was on a trip to uh, the Washita, I mean the Canadian Valley, to get a load of corn, not the same trip I described before. There was a, a very high wind, and a fire broke out northwest of us. And the sky was very red, and we were very frightened. Two neighbors came up, one from... high wind and a fire broke out northwest of us and the sky was very red and we were very frightened two neighbors came up one from directly east of us and another northeast because they knew that my father was away and they came to try to help build a guard west of our house that the fire could not jump but the wind was so extremely high that it was a very hard thing to do my mother at that time was carrying my little sister and uh, that in, in that condition, she helped fight the fire and build the guard. The fire itself never reached us, but they had to build this back guard, you see. Do you know about it? And uh, they did build it wide enough that it might have jumped. Uh, it might not have jumped. It might have been saved. But there was a new house across the creek from us that had been built a very nice house, the nicest one in anywhere in the neighborhood. And they had gone back to Pratt, Kansas to bring their family down. And uh, Mama and these two neighbors wanted to try to save that house if they could. I was in the, uh, in our home and Mama had told me that if fire ever reached there, that uh, I was to go to the cellar. I'd be perhaps be safe there. The fire came within a quarter of a mile of that new house, and the wind changed and took it straight south out in barren country. Saved the, the house was saved. That was one of my very vivid experiences. Another uh, rather, uh, not a very great experience, but for a six-year-old girl, uh, my father put me on, uh, he took me to the Miller Post Office, which was four miles west of us. And uh, uh, a week later, he put me on a horse and said, go and get the mail. My mother protested and thought it was terrible to let a, I wasn't quite six yet, uh, to uh, put, uh, send me in strange country. And he said, well, what can hurt her? The horse is gentle. <laughs> that was quite an experience. Tell us about social life during the 1890s. 
About what? About the social life of young people during the 1890s. Well, it was very, very few parties, and of course, older people uh, sometimes had dances in their home, but I was not permitted to go to a dance. And uh, there weren't. Uh, there were entertainments that uh, closed the school, and there were lyceum courses at the school, and uh, there were generally uh, school Christmas trees. I mean, uh, community Christmas trees, but. There was very... Tell about the community Christmas tree, Brian. What, it, uh, what, what activity took place around that? Well, programs. Uh, they uh, they were went someplace and cut a tree and decorated it with... Uh, cut a cedar tree and decorated it with uh, strings of popcorn and cranberries if they could get them in town and uh, I don't think they had any candles I think they were afraid of candles and uh, a few apples that's one thing my father always had he always had a barrel of apples in the ba in the cellar that was something you people could, don't think so much about nowadays, but that was as scarce, uh, they were as scarce as ice, and uh, it was a very hard uh, thing to uh, always have, with no refrigeration, it was very hard to always have uh, food if people happened in, and if they happened in, they had to be fed always and my mother would say uh, she'd see someone coming that she recognized the rig and she would say run out and catch a chicken and dress it because I've got fried chicken for dinner <laughs> and uh, there were there was uh, preaching at the uh, there were revival meetings at the at the uh, schoolhouse about the baptism? The what? The baptism. Well, the baptism was generally uh, in some pool, and uh, my father built a small dam across the creek and had quite a good-sized pool there on his farm, and there were a number of baptisms there. In fact, I was baptized there myself. I uh, did. I don't know that that really had a name. It was a very small running creek until he dammed it. Do you remember the first electric plant they tried to build in 1890? The what? The first electric plant that was attempted by Jones, Strickler, Jones, P.C. Jones. When did you first see electric lights? In Edmond, I'm sure, when I was going to school there. Uh, that's the first, uh, I was in Edmond the first time I ever talked over a telephone. I had relatives in Minko, and uh, there was only one telephone in Edmond, and that was in, the, in Oscar Howard's uh, drugstore. And uh, I went to the drugstore and talked to, to Minko. What caused you to go to Chickasaw in 1901? What? Well, my father had uh, been, uh, he had rented the farm out, and uh, he wasn't too well satisfied. And I guess just like most pioneers, just wanted to get a little farther into uncivilized country. Uh, and I was, uh, at that time, I was, going to be graduated from the normal and knew I was going to teach and I had 
heard a lot about Chickasha and decided that I would uh, apply there for a school. And he said, well, that he went down to Marlowe and Duncan and Chickasha and inspected them and said if I was determined to go to Chickasha to teach, and by the way, I had not been elected. I don't know how I knew I would be. And um, so they moved down there, and my father bought a grocery store, had a grocery store for a number of years in Chickasha. What was Chickasha like when you first was down there? Well, uh, it was very muddy. It didn't have, of course, any paving. It, uh, the sidewalks, some of them were high enough, they were up on stilts, high enough that a horse could be hitched underneath them because uh, when it rained real hard, it flooded. And uh, I've driven down the street of Chickasha many times and been hub deep in mud. I don't remember the first time I saw an automobile. The first time I rode in an automobile was a white steamer owned by J.R. Abercrombie, who owned a very, in those days, a very up-to-date grocery store. And uh, they were very good friends of ours. And we were, that was the first time I ever rode in a, it did not have a top, as I remember. It was a four-passenger car, but did not have a top. Did you ever, did you imagine at that time that it would have an impact that, uh, on the American life and economy and uh, habits that it did? No, I'm sure that I uh, had very little thought about that. <laughs> I was married in November 1906. Well, my husband had uh, lived in Texas, and in 98, his family came to Chickasha. At that time, they were expecting to uh, get Indian land, and uh, they, you might say, preempted land. They settled on certain land. They couldn't file on it. They couldn't get title to it, but they had a right to, uh, if it was owned, if somebody else lived on it who didn't have the right either, but they would sell their uh, improvements to someone that uh, that the Indian law would finally give uh, the property. And my husband's family moved there and secured some very good land, but later they were not left on the Indian rolls and had to give it all up. Your, your mother, your, your Yes, yes, part choked up. And your husband's name, you, uh, he was Bert Barefoot. Bert, Bert Boone, that was his mother's name. She was a Boone. And uh, my husband was named Bert Boone. He went to school uh, at, he was born at Montague, Texas, and later the family moved to, uh, Nocona. He went through high school at Nocona and then to Georgetown University, which was uh, a Methodist school, and later uh, became the uh, the Dallas Methodist School. Uh, what is the name of it? The university? Uh, Southern Methodist University. 
Southern Methodist University. Well, uh, the uh, family who, um, the Wootons, of course, were the most outstanding citizens because of the uh, Cotton Oil Company, uh, Chickasha Cotton Oil Company. And uh, they had a very wonderful family of eight children. They were Mr. Wooten was a very philanthropic man, and uh, they had also a um, compress and uh, an oil mill, and a lovely home. But there's been tragedy in the family, and there are very few of them left, even the grandchildren. There are some out here. Yes, yeah, some of the grandchildren. Yes, uh -huh. The uh, uh, Mr. Wooten's first name was uh, the oldest. Do you remember? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I know it employed a number of people, and uh, they had uh, gins and and uh, mills in a number of different uh, towns in southwestern Oklahoma, in Aldous and Frederick, and all of those cotton raising countries. Uh, Counties. Well, I think originally that the uh, mill was owned by Myron's father. He had two sons, uh, Ed and Myron, and uh, he finally. Ed was in uh, El Reno, and Myron was in, Ch he put Myron in Chickasha to manage that one. And uh, Ed finally went to uh, Pillsbury, I believe. I'm sure. Minneapolis, is that where Pillsbury is? Ed was uh, very high in the Pillsbury Company at one time. Myron remained in Chickasha until his death, but he had sold the mill. Well, it was um, it was the land was given by J. B. Sparks. He was an Indian citizen. His first wife was a part Indian woman, and uh, they had one daughter named Nellie. And uh, I. He later married, after he lost that wife, he later married uh, another lady and had two, had three children by her. But uh, Nellie was at school at Columbia, M Missouri. She was 15. There she took pneumonia and died. And uh, in memory, in her memory, her father gave the first land that that the school was built on. And the first dormitory that was uh, 
built there was uh, named the Nellie Sparks Dormitory. Do you remember anything about the early days of the school? Well, I remember considerable about it. I never did go to school there. I had uh, one young lady who lived with me for through the entire school year. Her mother was a widow and she needed to uh, she needed to uh, have help to send the girl to school and she lived in my home for three years and uh, I knew I knew the, all the teachers I knew the president's wife very intimately of course we had a number of of uh, presidents, but uh, we were always very friendly with all of them. And Can you recall any of the presidents or uh, faculty of the school who stood out for you as uh, particularly memorable or outstanding? Well, the the um, the head of the history department for many years was Jeffy Young. The uh, head of the speech department was Francis Davis. And uh, the uh, head of the, of, the of the English department was Carolyn Laird, and it was with Miss Laird that I commuted the two years that uh, that I went to Norman uh, when I got my degree over there. And, uh, oh, I, I knew them all, but I just don't, all their names don't come to me right now. Tell a little about your teaching experience. The first year I taught in the Grogan building. That was a two-story building. I taught second grade. It was a marvelous experience and I had many wonderful children in my room. The second year I taught out uh, several blocks from the Grogan building in a uh, frame residence, vacant residence. And uh, that was the year that I went on to El Reno and taught for three months. Then uh, they built the uh, they built what was known, they built three uh, grade buildings, one known as the North, one as the South, and one as the West building. I was made principal of the South building the second year that I taught there. I was had the fourth grade the first year the building was built. And I think that um, Outside of what I mentioned before about the children being older because of having short terms and uh, some of them not having had an opportunity to go in the earlier days at all, that they were a very uh, easy to teach children. I remember I had very little trouble with any of them. Uh, <laughs> I recall one incident. A uh, little boy came to school one day with his shoes laced with white, shoes, white string. And um, I said, William, why don't you get some shoe strings? And he said, oh, Miss Spencer, I'm never be anything but a cow puncher. <laughs> oh, 
Well, it was $40 at first, but after I became principal, I got $5 more, 45 What? For a month, forty-five dollars a month. Um, you were telling us before we started taping that uh, about the financial problem they had down there as a result of the inability. Can you explain that? Well, no one uh, owned their property. They thought they did, but they had no title to it. And they, uh, the government had issued no patents to that to the, the town site. And uh, they could not tax real estate. If you had a fence, a cave, a barn, a house, or any simple improvement on a piece of uh, land, on a lot that uh, uh, you could hold it, until the titles were issued, and they were issued to those people who had any improvements on the land, but they could not be taxed at that time, and only real estate could be taxed, and the funds were just not sufficient to uh, uh, run a school more than five months. What, uh, were you, what were your Well, I guess people had the dates the same as they do now. I met my husband very soon. Well, the first fall that I was there, I met my husband. He was he was back from uh, college, graduated from college and started his law practice. I met him and uh, Uh, he and I were very close for five years when we married. 1906. 1906. What uh, was your, uh, you and your husband, what activities were you particularly active you, in? What do you want, a light? Huh? <coughs> we'll turn on these lamps. What were yours and your husband's activities? Oh, parties and entertaining and dances and all sorts of things that people do and church work and the uh, he became uh, uh, he he, uh, he was, was he was the first county attorney after statehood. He ran for that office um, and we. Uh, we had statehood in November of uh, 1907, and then he had been el elected, and uh, he was first county attorney. Do you recall any particular cases that he, re that he had in those early days that was memorable to you? Well, I'm sure there were some very important ones, but... Uh, I don't recall he just judge first. when he wa was elected to the criminal court in 37. He took office uh, in uh, January 37. Were there any experiences in Sick and Day that you think were particularly memorable that ought to be recorded? There were very many memorable ones. There's where most of my life, I feel, was lived and where my children were reared. And what it was a very happy life. Do you remember any important events that took place in Ticker Shade that uh, are particularly memorable? I'm uh, thinking of uh, as far as the town is concerned. Well, I think that one of the... Uh, very memorable ones was uh, Florence Hall and and uh, the uh, flight 
that they made and uh, Florence Hall furnished the money. Florence Hall was uh, at one time uh, the executive in a bank there and uh, when the uh, oil boom came to Burke Burnett, Texas, he went down there and uh, was very successful financially and he furnished the money for the Winnie Mae to make the trip and Post, of course, was the, Wiley Post was the uh, pilot. And the reception that was given there uh, after, uh, after the return, the Halls lived in Chickasha for an, a number of years. Winnie Mae lived there. And Did you know the Halls? Oh, very well, very well. I think that um, Florence Hall had a plane. Now, I never did have a ride in that plane, but I, n a number of my friends did uh, go on trips with uh, uh, the Halls and Wiley as a pilot. I think it was Wiley's, uh, Wiley was his personal pilot for a time. And then he backed the trip that he and Gaddy made. I don't think he had anything to do with the trip that he and Will Rogers made. I don't believe that he did. But that was the beginning of the fame of Wiley Post, wasn't it? The beginning of the fame of Wiley Post was when Florence Hall was backing him and yeah. sending him to various places. Do you recall uh, any particular when your husband came here to the, to the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals? Do you recall any particular memorable uh, uh, occasions uh, that your husband may have talked about or may have had in his official position? Well, it, there w it was a, certainly a different life from what I've led since he passed away. It was a uh, constant meeting with. Uh, officials of the state and uh, close friends and do you recall any experiences in any of these areas we're nearing the end of this tape that you feel uh Do you recall any experiences in any of these areas where it's nearing the end of this tape that you feel uh, ought to be recorded? This has been a very excellent interview. Do you think of anything, though, that, or do you think of anything, Reggie, that ought to be? Reggie and I have talked a lot in the garden. <laughs> has, has, uh, has she told you anything that we have not put on but ought to be on? Well, I was thinking about uh, when your husband ran for office, the year that you bought your office, maybe, uh, I thought that was in Calabasas. <laughs> well, the, uh, this was his third, this was his third uh, campaign, and we needed a new car. We had gone through the war with a Packard that was not fit to start the campaign in. And so we uh, finally decided that uh, we had to have a car. But that was after the war, and it was almost impossible to get one. And uh, finally, we went to the black market and paid $2,600 cash for a little Plymouth, a little red Plymouth. That little Plymouth is in my garage now. 
and has been in constant use since that time, which was in May of 1948. Thank you very much. It's been an interview with uh, Mrs. Bert uh, Barefoot.